these are supported by Matflix, which is video streaming from maternity experts. It's excellent for CPD and anyone who's looking at revalidation, you might want this, and anyone who wants some resources for their students or who is a student themselves or wanting to become a student midwife. It's a fantastic resource and very accessible, an all online resource, which is what we want at the moment. I'm delighted to be here this evening, and this evening I'm joined by Francesca Entwistle, who is Professional Officer, Policy and Advocacy Lead, UNICEF UK, and Professor Amy Brown, Professor of Child Public Health, Department of Public Health, Policy and Social Sciences at Swansea University. And I'm going to start off by asking Francesca, for a moment of the week. This is a little bit of a tradition for this hour. Okay. Hi everybody, it's lovely to be here tonight. Um, my moment of the week actually came from today. Um, as we're all getting used to working um, on Teams and Zoom and everything, we had the most fabulous meeting this afternoon with all the uh, infant feeding leads around the UK. All the four devolved nations, nine regions of England, neonatal and universities. and they represent 800 infant feeding specialists across the country, mm. and which equates to about 800,000 babies across the UK over a year. And what they're doing to support mothers is just inspirational. And I'd like to bring what they're doing to, to out there on, you know, every day to this tonight. So thank you all. Wow, that is a moment. Yeah, it was, it was great. It was lovely. <laughs> Okay, I'll try Amy, Amy Brown. So, Your moment. <laughs> I had to think about this when we were asked earlier, and I think mine's a bit more off-piste maybe than Francesca's, but I decided we all needed cheering up. So I was on Twitter earlier, and I saw this story alongside lots of other people on Twitter about this uh, town in California where 200 goats have broke free and started running through the town. Now, they've all been herded up again, but go and have a look on Twitter at the video footage. If you're feeling anxious or low, not now, obviously, after this, but go and have a look at 200 goats running around a small town. Fantastic. That, <laughs> that's a big contrast, but I love the goats. Yeah. <laughs> I, I shall have my own moments. And, and I was torn, but I've chosen, I think, the International Day of the Nurse, which was yesterday, because I started thinking about my own life before I came into midwifery as a, as a student nurse and then a nurse. And I just remembered the sort of togetherness of being a student nurse and being a, a nurse. And it made me reflect that having the day and seeing lots of people's images on Twitter and on Facebook everyone in their lovely old fashioned uniforms with their lovely little belt buckles. And what did they all have on their heads? Hats. <laughs> and uh, uh, one of my favorite photos of myself, sadly, for those of you who don't approve of hats, was with the hat with the strings. Anyone who remembers that? Very traditional and it's going back a long way. That just shows how old I am now. Anyway, I'm going to move to the business now. So I'm just about to uh, share the screen. There we go. Oh, no, that. There we go. And this is our title for the day. Um, and we, we really designed these hours. I'm not going to repeat about the um, map flicks, um, but this, this will be available. This whole hour is available after today and on map flicks and on podcasts on Facebook. Facebook and everything so you can if you miss anything or you your friends miss it you will have access access to it but we really wanted something instead of the midwifery festivals that have gone on for a long time and also a lot of people attend we wanted something for midwives for student midwives for doulas for people who wanted to become midwives just to give you a snapshot of information once a week and bring people together because we were very aware that some people were in practice and obviously very busy with everything that, that COVID-19 is bringing to them. But we we're also aware that some people are on lockdown, um, either because they're shielding or they're being shielded. And we wanted to make sure everybody retained that family, the family feel of being a midwife. 
So that's why the, these hours came into being. I also want to spend a moment, and I always do this, I just spend a moment to think about the people, especially in the um, health and social care areas who we've lost over the last few weeks, because many, many people who are listening to this hour will know somebody or their friend that might have had a friend or a family member who has been who has been hit by the COVID-19. And I'd just like to say we are thinking about all these people, precious people and their families, the, the people that we lost. It's very sad. You know, there's over 200 people who are lost um, and we're with you on this. So this is just our moment of solidarity for all of the NHS and key workers and their families and their friends. So many people are being um, affected over these last few weeks. And the key workers, well, that's just about everybody who keeps the country going, from the lorry drivers to the, the bus drivers to the, to the everybody, the, the dustmen, everyone who keeps us all going and keeps us comfortable and safe. And we need to say thank you to all of them. I always also put this slide up just to remind us that this is still the year of the nurse and it's still the year of the midwife. We started the year on a very positive note because we thought it was going to be a time of celebration, happiness and joy. I think what it has been is a time of celebration in a way of nurses and midwives because they've really come up to the plate. They've had been centre stage of the whole crisis and have illustrated how important they are to the NHS and to the population and to the whole society. So in a way, this is still a celebration, but it's though it's a very difficult, painful time. I'm just highlighting some, some news. This is another bit of my task. It's a tricky week because some people are returning to work, but now instead of staying home, we're meant to stay alert. But for some of us, that still means staying at home. We had International Day of the Nurse yesterday, 12th of May, so there were many celebrations and uh, plaudits going on there as well. And I just thought I'd highlight the UK Obstetric Surveillance System, otherwise known as UCOS study, which has reported, I think a couple of days ago, on the basis of 429 pregnant and childbearing women, finding that at the moment, pregnant women are no more at risk than the general population. But like the general, general data that's being gathered for people who are affected by COVID, BAME women are more at risk at the rate of 55%. And women also who've got pre-existing health conditions, they're more at risk of, of being affected. And five pregnant women have died. Um, though it's uncertain at the moment whether this was due to COVID-19, they're still, still under investigation. And one in 10 women required intensive care. And, uh, and it seems to be that women in the third trimester are more affected than those in early pregnancy. So, I mean, it's just, just a little snippet and you can get more information looking at the MPEU website for that. Um, there's still... I just wanted to highlight the Midwifery Forum online streaming for the um, International Day of the Midwife last week. We just had some fab speakers, including Roy Lilly, Jess Phillips talking about domestic violence, Professor Mary Renfrew and Professor Leslie Page and the team from the Practicing Midwife, um, Anna Byram and Claire Feely, plus the lots of top clips to look at. So those are, they're still on the agenda for us. So again, maternity service, we carry on throughout. Antenatal and postnatal care still required and at a high level and mothers and women, baby, babies are still being born. And I think that because this is the centre of this evening's uh, session, mothers and babies still need information. They still need care and support for themselves and their families. And we really felt that this was the time to look at some of the debate that's been going on about infant feeding. There's lots of um, stories in the press that I think women are getting worried about and also midwives are getting worried about. So I'm really so pleased that we have two experts to come and, and share their expertise with us. So 
I'm going to firstly introduce Francesca Entwistle. And those of you, many of you will know Francesca. She's a midwife and a midwife lecturer of over 35 years. I'm always surprised when I see those years because she looks very young and vital. She works as the policy advocacy lead at UNICEF Baby Friendly Initiative. Her specialist interest is in infant feeding and it was consolidated through her research exploring the impact of midwifery training and women's self-efficacy on breastfeeding outcomes from women from low-income groups. It's really important. She's worked with the Department of Health, developing policy and practice in relation to maternal infant nutrition and regularly consults with key stakeholders to ensure the focus on improving public health through breastfeeding and very early child development in the UK. So at the moment, she's leading the National Infant Feeding Network and during the COVID-19 outbreak, she's been working with the local maternity service to, to deliver virtual infant feeding conversations with mothers in the antenatal and postnatal period. So welcome very much, Aunt Francesca. The floor or screen is yours. Hi. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to take you on a little running stop tour of what we've been doing at UNICEF UK Baby Friendly Initiative in response to the COVID outbreak. Um, first of all, though, I just thought we should um, reflect on why Baby Friendly exists and um, what we're doing and what we've been doing actually for a long time now um, around the world and in UK. In UK. Everything we do at Baby Friendly is based on the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. And this is the world's greatest promise to all children to ensure that their rights are met. Um, and one of those rights is um, around their nutrition and that they receive breast milk where possible. Um, and that's been, this was celebrated um, with its 30th anniversary last year. So um, as part of that promise, we're looking at today um, why breastfeeding matters and why we're, we're Baby Friendly um, aims to support that through its care and support for health professionals. So um, fundamentally, we know that breastfeeding and breast milk itself, human milk, um, reduces the risk of babies developing infections and improves the health and well-being outcomes for babies, their mothers and families in the short and long term. Um, and there's no evidence at this time um, from any of the research that coronavirus can be passed through breast milk. And indeed, if in donor milk, it would be, um, if there was any virus there, it would be killed by the pasteurization process. So therefore, as health professionals, as midwives and healthcare assistants, health visitors, we should do all we can to promote, protect and support breastfeeding and the use of human milk for all babies and their mothers at this time and um, their families. And indeed that they deserve that best care we can provide for them. So these are some of the things we've been doing. Um, our aim is um, very, very much primarily, and you'll hear from Amy more about um, what the mother support groups are doing, but our aim is to support health professionals to continue to provide the best care related to infant feeding during this time. And you can find all the resources I'm referring to on the website um, under that link, um, just Google baby friendly COVID-19. So we've got a few, three statements. Um, the first statement is a general statement about infant feeding. It covers um, both breastfeeding and formula feeding and um, gives some background and some key principles of care during the outbreak. The second um, statement is on care within neonatal units. Um, and really, our three standards in neonatal units are to provide breast milk for babies, but also to support parents to have a close and loving relationship with their baby and support parents as partners in care. And lots of us have heard stories and about mothers and babies being separated. We are updating this statement this week because the evidence has moved on and we really do want mothers and babies, parents to stay with their babies on the neonatal unit where possible. Our third statement is around all of you who are working hard to implement the baby friendly standards. 
um, obviously that's changed because of the situation um, and there's more information on how we can um, carry those out remotely on some occasions, but what we're planning to do going forward. Um, one of the things that came to light very early on was the, for those families that were formula feeding, um, in the initial stages, there was um, a shortage of uh, formula milk in the shops. Um, however, that has settled down. But there are also more families in crisis at the moment um, and turning to universal credit. And there may be delays in them being able to afford or access um, infant formula. And this is a guidance document for local authorities to help ensure that they do that through um, in light of the International Code of Marketing of Breast Milk Substitutes. And what have we been doing for you as midwives? Well, um, all of the work, took the work that Sue talked about from the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists and the RCM um, highlighted how some of the roles of the midwife um, and who's delivering care has changed. And we know that for some um, people now delivering that care, it might be a third year student who's um, progressing quickly to qualification or a maternity care assistant or a, a midwife returning to practice after many years. And we wanted to look at what would work to support all of you, but those as well, in having that virtual conversation that you may never have done in your career before. So that when you're sat on the phone, you've got a prompt sheet next to you and you can make good and accurate records and make sure that they're completed um, accurately. Um, so we've got one on the actual conversation, on antenatal infant feeding conversations, postnatal conversations. Um, and then also when a mother and baby are separated because of the coronavirus, maybe the mother has the virus and she has to be separated from her baby in the neonatal unit. How you keep up that close and loving relationship with the mother and baby by maybe doing video contacts, um, having you know things that the mother can wear down her bra that gets swapped between the baby and the mother so they have the smell of each other. We've also... Um, heard of women who are trying to maximize the amount of breast milk they're giving or even relactating in this time knowing that breast milk can um, help to reduce the uh, risk of respiratory infection. Of course women um, will do uh, when they start to breastfeed some women come across um, challenges and the midwife in her consultation over the phone will also have to have conversations about that so again we've done some prompt sheets and guidance sheets on having a conversation with mothers where there's a challenge um, on various topic areas um, and they take you on a step-by-step -step approach on what what would work um, and what could work and when you need to refer on um, Obviously, safety is our, um, a key challenge here and recognising when things aren't right. The midwives known as being a career that, and a skill that is um, both an art and a science. And when you can't feel and touch a baby and see a mother, it can sometimes be difficult to make that assessment. So um, these guidance sheets are hoping to help you prompt those conversations in that way. Um, and also to support that person who may not be who may be devolved to this job, and they may be sort of asked to help the infant feeding lead out or do an infant feeding lead role because infant feeding consultation because the infant feeding lead may have coronavirus. Um, she may want to refresh herself on her knowledge and skills around infant feeding. So we've done some quick, um, like one-stop shop, bite-sized um, refresher sheets for those working in infant feeding. Um, and particularly around positioning and attachment, um, getting breastfeeding off to a, to a good start, um, hand expressing, all those skills that you would normally maybe do on face to face, but you might need to just refresh your own and knowledge and skills, give you confidence over the phone. So what other work have we been doing? Um, we, on the web page, um, we've got a series of frequently asked questions where um, we're updating them on all, all the time. Um, and trying to answer questions that come up on Facebook, on Twitter, um, through the media, from individuals, from the Infant Feeding Network, um, so that we remain contemporary and up to date and can help people still um, provide the best care possible. And then a couple of weeks ago, I, I mentioned in my opening that we um, run the National Infant Feeding Network. Um, a couple of weeks ago, we sent out a um, survey monkey to all the infant feeding leads in the country. 
and had over 225 responses. Um, and the survey was looking at how services have changed since the beginning of the, the outbreak um, and to both the infant feeding needs and to the provision of services for mothers, for example, can they still access an infant feeding specialist? Can they um, access um, tongue tie services? Um, is there still an infant feeding need in post? Um, and we're just collating those results at the moment um, and they'll be out probably next week. Um, so look out for those coming through our websites and through the network. Um, so, and to, um, to conclude, and maybe going back to what Sue was saying um, about um, reflecting on those in the service that have been lost um, to uh, coronavirus, UNICEF is there to protect all children. Um, and part of our values and principles are about being honest. We're trying to be honest with um, our health professionals and with midwives and with women and say what we can provide and what we can do at the moment. We're trying to be smart by getting things out to you promptly and in a manner that's usable and user friendly. We're trying, trying to be brave by very much in the in natal care, we're seeing mothers and babies separated and maybe that's not always the best way forward. And so we're being brave to say that and looking at ways we can use the knowledge and evidence that we've got to keep mothers and babies together um, and, and fathers um, and have them as parents, as partners in care, not visitors in a neonatal unit. And we look to be hopeful. We, we want to make sure that, um, again, as we said at the beginning, babies are still being born, mums are still getting pregnant, and we are hopeful for the future that we will use what we're learning now, build on it, um, and take the best of it into our future practice. Um, and today, UNICEF UK, uh, Global um, and UNICEF UK as a bigger organisation launched a campaign um, to save the generation COVID. They feel that it's the biggest global crisis since the World War II. Um, and new research shows that 6,000 children a day could die in the next six months because of coronavirus, because of weaknesses in the national health systems and disruption to vital services across the world. Um, and they're asking for support from it, all of us if we're able to give that. So please go to the website and have a look. Okay, I don't know how I'm doing for time, Sue, but um, I have that feel that's coming to an, that comes to an end. Okay, that's fantastic, Francesca. And I think that's quite a um, well, it's quite it's a, a sad point to to kind of end on. Uh, the thought of a generation COVID, it kind of, because people are talking about or when it's, a, it's an end and we go back to normal, of course, there isn't going to be a normal and there's going to be a long time with mothers and babies who are, and families who are affected. And I think that's important for us to remember. So thank you for, for bringing that to the end point, um, even if it is quite uncomfortable. It feels like it reflects on what you said, really, about the healthcare workers as well, Sue, that yeah. um, we can do what we can at the moment, but we mustn't forget where the effect this is having. Um, on a wider all. picture. Yeah, that's great. Thank you very much, Francesca. I know there'll be some questions for you okay. after, <laughs> at the end point. So I shall move in, a, in an elegant manner to <laughs> Professor Amy Brown, who is our next speaker. She is, as I said earlier, Professor of Child Public Health at Swansea University. She's got a background of psychology and she spent the last 13 years exploring psychological, cultural and societal influences upon infant feeding. So she's been quite busy for the last 13 years uh, and, and looking at dis infant feeding decisions in the first year. And her research seeks to understand how we can shift our perception of how babies are fed away from an individual mothering issue to a wider public health problem. I always love to listen to Amy talking on this, this is get it going. She's published papers and books widely. An example is the Positive Breastfeeding book and Everything You Need to Feed Your Baby with Confidence. And she's also a blogger and a tweeter. So I'm delighted you can be with us, Amy. 
And I'm sorry we can only give you 15 minutes. Like Francesca, I know this topic, we could all talk for at least an hour each and we wouldn't be bored. So the screen is yours, Naomi. Um, so what I was planning on talking about with my slides was actually just really picking up on what um, Francesca was talking about and really wanted to give it a bit of context as why it's so important. I mean, Francesca talked about the impact on baby's health, on mother's health. But as a psychologist, I've always really been interested in what breastfeeding means for women. So I'm not talking about women who don't want to breastfeed or women who decide that it's better for them and their family to formula feed. But I'm really thinking about those women who really, really want to breastfeed and what it means to them when they're unable to do it. So we have so many policies in place to try and support breastfeeding mothers. But in the UK, we've actually got pretty much the lowest breastfeeding rates in the entire world. We start off all right. We have lots of women really, really, really wanting to breastfeed. But actually, the experiences they have in the weeks after starting mean that our rates fall really, really rapidly. So we only have about half of women breastfeeding at all by about six weeks, which is fairly low. The main bit about that statistic for me is 90%, 80-90% of them, depending on what survey you read, weren't actually ready to stop. And that leaves them feeling a whole range of emotions through from anger at what happened. Um, you told me breastfeeding was really good for me and my baby. Um, why wasn't I able to do it? Through to sadness, through to grief. And I've written about this a lot in a lot of blog articles, just about how it can really damage women emotionally and damage them for a long time when their feeding plans don't go to plan. And it's again, it's not just necessarily a bit of sadness and a bit of, all right, I'm happy to formula feed. It's the whole of the context of what it means. And again, what my research has done over the, I think, 13, we might be up to 14 or 15 by now, um, is actually trying to figure out what's gone wrong. So why do we have women who really want to breastfeed their babies not being able to do so? And there are multiple layers on them there. There's issues with uh, not enough investment in support services for them. There's issues with partner attitudes, there's issues with pressures from work, there's issues about how we see women's bodies and not liking them breastfeed in public, um, there's issues with not being able to get a medical diagnosis if something is going wrong and it is all brought down with women ending up feeling really guilty. So that's the context of what I do. And I've been reflecting alongside a number of other people in the last few weeks about what does this all mean in the COVID crisis? Where are we with breastfeeding support at the moment for women? And how are we making sure that families actually get the information and support that they need? And um, what I was going to show you was a screen that showed a Cochrane review about the importance of breastfeeding support for women and it talked about how when women get really good support their breastfeeding experience is more likely to go smoothly. That's not saying that absolutely every woman who tries to breastfeed and gets amazing support will automatically be able to do it. There will always be instances where it just doesn't work sometimes for women. But looking at women as a as a kind of a larger group for most if they get good support it will be a generally more straightforward experience and what struck me when looking at that Cochrane review earlier was one of the things that they highlighted was that face-to-face -face support was the very best way of supporting women and they found that when women had regular um, support from people they knew and trusted over time antenatally postnatally and it was face-to-face -face, then that really helped them and of course that's gone out of the window with COVID hasn't it we just aren't able to give the same level of support we did before so what that means for women is they may not be able to um, have somebody coming around and um, checking their latch so much. Um, it might not be that um, there to have those very small adjustments that might really help them. They haven't got necessarily someone in the same room as them. And yes, you can have somebody on a video call, but it's not necessarily the same in terms of body language and emotional support that you can feel from being near someone. It also means that they don't get the face-to-face -face peer support. And with peer support, it's not just about going along to a group of other women who know how you're feeling and can help you to breastfeed. It's about that solidarity of being able to go along and maybe just sit in the corner drinking a cup of tea and not saying anything and realizing that everybody just gets it. So 
when we realized all this was happening, I was just amazed. Amazed is possibly the right word because it sounds like I didn't think it would happen, but just in awe, maybe, of how much the breastfeeding organizations, lactation consultants, health sisters, midwives, they all just managed to produce this complete change in how they delivered their services. So video support, um, online support, online peer support groups where women can come along and meet other women. It's been fantastic. There is just this whole community out there now. And just started thinking there again, but what does that mean? So for your average woman, if you're now sat at home trying to breastfeed your baby in the time of COVID, um, are you going to have a better experience? Are you going to have a worse experience? And really, as with anything, it's going to very much depend on who you are and what layers of support and privilege you really have around you. We're starting some research just um, with the Breastfeeding Network, so hopefully get this going in the next week, really looking at women's experiences and getting them to tell us about what's happened to them over the last few weeks. And we've based that on some anecdotal evidence that women have been giving me um, and others when we've been talking about it online over the last few weeks. And it kind of falls into two main things. So you've got the positive elements of how women might actually be protected a little bit during social distancing in that some women are saying that they're actually having a really positive breastfeeding experience because their situation of having to stay at home and not having lots of visitors around and not feeling they have to rush about everywhere means they've actually got the excuse almost to sit on the sofa and just breastfeed their baby. They haven't got to worry about um, being seen and being out and about and kind of that pressure we have on some women and they feel more strongly that they have to get their life back and they have to be out there and there's a uh, something to be had in being out of the house in the first week um, showing that you're busy and coping with life that's all gone away because you can't really go anywhere unless you're going for a walk it also means that perhaps visitors who are less welcome won't actually be able to come around and announce they can't just turn up on your doorstep and insist they're coming in because you can just point them to the social distancing guidelines. For some women, and again, this is going to be contextual and it's not going to work for all, they might have their partner at home more who can help out, who can really kind of be involved with things. And, you know, if you're an introvert and you've just had a baby, then maybe you're in your little cocoon and you're quite happy that way. As I say, we've also had this huge step up in the support that mums have. So for those mums who prefer having perhaps video support they didn't really like leaving the house to have to go to a peer support group just being able to click on a zoom link and have a peer support group there could be really helpful for them and again if you think about women who might not want to go out and see a lactation consultant then they can have someone zoom into their living room and um, just help them and talk to them there and I think I can't I think it was uh, Emma Pickett from the Association of Breastfeeding Mothers who was saying that actually technology had worked quite well for her because she was able to use kind of several screens and really zoom in in a way that you probably couldn't with your face but you could hold a, a screen up really close when a mum was feeding or something. So we've got that one side which is kind of really positive but then we've got the other side which really might not be so positive. So the first thing that springs to mind is that um, we can sit here and it's sunny outside and got a nice garden and plenty of space but a lot of women aren't living that reality if they're cramped in a high-rise flat with very little space and they're really not getting to see the outside world much, you can really see how that's going to really knock on their well-being. If they're trapped with a partner um, who is either just unhelpful, um, who is not supportive of breastfeeding and is nagging them the whole time, or women in abusive situations, then I can see how that would really have a really awful impact. And it's something we really need to think about going forward. And we've been raising kind of awareness of this all the way through of what happens to families in these situations when they're just stuck they're kind of almost out the way as well, out of sight, stuck in a little room somewhere, um, not being able to get that support they need. So again, it's, it, it kind of worries me that we might see a situation where mums who are really privileged already and uh, really have the support system around them 
have a much better breastfeeding experience and those who were struggling are going to have a much worse breastfeeding experience and the kind of split there and how we really make sure if this carries on for longer if we have a second wave if we have any similar event in the future then how do we actually make sure that mums are all right in those situations and online support is great as well as long as you've got a screen big enough to do it as long as you've got a stable internet connection if you haven't got a good internet connection and you can't get into the zoom chat to talk to the other mums um where does that leave you it also worries me about women um we've seen generally haven't we with covid that people aren't going to a and e so much they aren't reporting concerns to their doctors um they're worried either about catching it or putting pressure on the system that is already struggling and it does worry me that if a mum had difficulties at home she might go oh uh maybe i shouldn't bother anybody with this maybe I should you know just try and carry on and she could end up with quite severe mastitis or something before she actually sought help so it's that kind of side of things other people you know if you're an extrovert yeah if you're an extrovert or if you have really supportive people then you're going to want to be out and about if you thrive from people um being around you, then you're probably going to feel pretty awful inside. If you've got really supportive family members who would have usually come to you, then of course that's going to be a knock on impact. Or if you're trying to look after other children as well. I mean, I just, I can't imagine how awful it must be to be stuck somewhere tiny with other children, young children to look after as well. And I just want to think from a researcher perspective going forward, how we can also work together to make sure that women aren't experiencing that. Just a slide I was going to finish with, and we can put it up for you. Um, just two main sources of information. I was going to say if any breastfeeding mother out there or anybody supporting them, um, please, this, all the main breastfeeding charity lines, they're still running. Um, we'll put the details in the link for you. Um, they're there. They're answering your calls. They've got online resources. The second one is the Association of Breastfeeding Mothers. If you go to their website and you click on the link that says COVID, um, they've actually compiled a whole list of different resources that are online that we're, they're trusted, they've been vetted, all for all sorts of different questions through from latch to normal baby behaviour. So you've really got a package there as well if you need support and help. And I think that would just be my message to you saying, if you're a breastfeeding mum out there, we know it matters to you. Um, we're trying to support you as much as possible. Um, please do reach out and ask what support is there in a way that you can access and is best for you. Great, thank you very much, Amy, and thank you for coping <laughs> without the slides. Amy can <laughs> talk <laughs> about slides, who knew? <laughs> oh no, I think it's fantastic. It's still, it's very smooth. I mean, I think what what I took out very strongly, because I, ha I hadn't, I know that people have talked about women over this period, have been actually being able to talk to each other better because yeah. for example in the hospital setting mm -hmm. there aren't a load of other visitors so they've been tending to open their curtains talk to other mums and I, that was feeling very positive but when you were talking about the women who might be disadvantaged living in a high-rise flat with very little space once again it's those women who haven't got as much who are going to yeah. be the ones that are struggling more but it's lovely to have the, the sort of these links for information you're going to say something so, I, I was just going to say it's going to exacerbate inequality isn't it the inequalities we've already seen are going to be exacerbated and how do we stop or at least reduce that happening yeah, yeah. it's it feels almost impossible but I, I know there'll be a way but thank you very much to both of you because I think that set us set set the scene and both sessions have, have really illustrated the practical things that practitioners are doing and the people who are involved in infant feeding are setting up and supporting even to the extent of thinking of the next stage of gathering up research to help future mums and and I guess this is all going on at the moment for you Amy as you're going just getting all that now I'm I, it's my, I, the reason I'm glancing down because I have the next task I have to do is to throw questions at you <laughs> Because people, oh my goodness, people have been been sending in some questions tonight. Okay, and the first the first person is a lady called Karina Marius, and she's saying, "Is the infant feeding resources available in other languages?" 
I guess that might be for Francesca. The, with the UNICEF materials. The specific ones we've done for coronavirus aren't available in different languages at the moment, but we do have a set of core uh, information leaflets in other languages on the website, if that's helpful to her. Okay. And would you have, because UNICEF is UNICEF, yes. I guess that you would be able to link up with other countries who have resources in different languages focusing on COVID. There is a um, global UNICEF website which has a Q&A on um, infant feeding. Okay, um, so, so but we, Karina ours could is go very on. much Ours is very much UNICEF UK. If, if anybody wanted to ask any questions specifically to um, Baby Friendly, we do have an email address which I could um, uh, inquire is at UNICEF UK uh, Baby Friendly which I'll send, okay. I'll send you the link um, soon. Okay, we'll put that on the resources sheet yes, afterwards. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, the next the next question is from Marjorie Asani, and she's saying, we are supporting more over video calls. What does everyone do about finding ways to communicate with non-English speakers, or I guess women who, who for English isn't their first language, I guess, too? Um. I know from the um, infant feeding leads in some of some of the areas, we the infant feeding network leads uh, across the, the UK that I was talking about talking to today, there are populations obviously where there are a lot of non-speaking mothers. And I think if they um, contacted their local infant feeding lead, there would be access to um, translators probably, and they'll, they'll find out what's available locally. Quite often those services are very good. Um, and particularly in this environment, you can have a, a translator in a, a three way. I mean, if there was always, a, if there's always a situation where if a mother really needed a face to face contact, the midwife would arrange that. Um, mm -hmm. You know, in whatever situation um, that would be, if there was a safety issue or a safeguarding issue or anything else, anybody doing that telephone conversation would find that isn't the appropriate way and would find a way that mm -hmm. if, they, if there was a need to do that. That's great. Thank you very much, Francesca. OK, now we've got Charlotte Ann is asking, initiation rates are often as a result of face to face support in postnatal weeks, whilst breastfeeding, expressing, etc. Do we think in the long term, as a result of peer support, the midwives having to do telephone contact, we'll see a drop in continuation rates? That might be to Amy. Again, I really am not sure on that one. Um, I think we might see that mixed bag in that a lot of women are very, very determined and a lot of breastfeeding supporters and midwives are very, very determined as well. I think it's really important that we've completely recognised that this is a major issue and that we're, there's so many resources have been developed for that. Um, Really, as I've said, I think it could go either way in that some women will have the resource and support and context of their personal lives to be able to be kind of benefiting from this. Others, they're going to find it much more difficult. And it will be interesting is really the wrong word here, but it'll be very interesting to see how it all plays out. And I think we're going to learn a lot of lessons about the benefits and disadvantages of online support because one of the positive things coming out of this is we've learned that it can help at least some women so how do we keep that going so that we've always got that kind of backup or different option for them um, if that's what they prefer or find easier so you're thinking so it's looking as though online and zoom and skype and all the online things that we've been doing over the last few weeks might be one of the things that we really keep Yes. Not for every woman, but maybe for those group of women who it might suit. Yeah, certainly I wouldn't want to see it instead of face to face mm. because face to face is so important for so many reasons, isn't it? You mm. know, body language, just that contact with someone and them being there. But certainly there are certain strengths to online stuff that we would like to keep. But I think it's really important that when we can get the face to face back, we get it back. Mm. Yeah, I, right. I think about the yeah. data, Sue. Um, we haven't been great at data in this country and um, <laughs> the infant feeding survey was last carried out in 2010 so it's a long time since we had UK wide data and prior to the uh, coronavirus the government had promised that we would have a 
a, some sort of survey in the next two years um, and they were just starting to plan it. So I think there's a need, very a big need to know what's going on around mm. infant feeding and there's an opportunity there for Public Health England and NHS England and Scotland and Wales and Northern Ireland to get together now to pull some data after this about how women are feeding in general, but also how COVID, COVID um, has uh, impacted on that, and that we all continue to collect the data that we can. It's a really, really good point, and it needs capturing in a meaningful way, and not just anecdotally, I think. Yeah. I think this is this looks like a sort of priority piece of research to me. It does, yeah, it does. Okay, and now I've got uh, Jane Marshall is saying, we have just started infant feeding cafe for the local community to access on university premises. But as the campus has been closed since March, this has sadly come to a halt for the time being. And she says, any advice on how these can, could continue remotely? I think there are lots of great examples out there that if you look at some of what the breastfeeding organizations have been doing and the charities and the peer supporters maybe have a chat to them and see what their lessons learned have been um, we've seen online support you can have a zoom meeting as such that's a breastfeeding support group where everybody comes along with their baby while sat up the <laughs> and your cup of tea <laughs> um, Thank you. As well, then aren't the NCT doing a um, pilot study with the uh, at the moment as well on um, co contacting parents together in this crisis? I think so. I think there's some work okay. going on with the NCT. Okay, it's keeping a track of all these different things going on. I think because it, as as a midwife, you kind of need to know locally what there is and what you can guide women to. And I guess one of the difficulties is actually knowing. Like when you're raising that, Francesca, whether it's a local or a nation, national thing and whether you can plug into it easily. I think what's been really impressive um, through both the mother support groups and the local infant feeding leads is that they pull together and they're yeah. working together to provide resources on there. So if you went on to, say, I don't know, Chelsea and Westminster Hospital maternity site, for example, you'd find um, access to all the local resources that are there for them. Mm -hmm. And so if you're a mother, I would say go to your local resource, look on the local website that, that is linked to your maternity service. Um, and um, I know that the local infant feeding needs have been working across their services mm -hmm. with local authorities, with health visitors and with the peer support groups and um, mother to mother support groups to pull that information together. And the breastfeeding network as well, um, ABM, Association of Breastfeeding Mothers, they've all got um, great resources online and directing mm. people to those. Fabulous, thank you very much. I'm going to have another a practical question now from Susan Vining. She says, why are mums advised to wear masks to breastfeed but not to formula feed? Both hold the baby near and breathe on them. This is at my local maternity unit. That's a very good question. <laughs> Isn't it? <laughs> it is. I think the WHO guidance is, um, I think there's a difference between uh, a mother who's COVID positive and a mother who is just under the normal care of the maternity system. Um, I know um, the RCOG and the RCM have put out clear guidance on use of PPE, PPE by um, healthcare workers when the mother is in the unit. If a mother is COVID positive and she's formula feeding, somebody else can do it um, who isn't COVID positive, of course. However, we know that breast, uh, co coronavirus isn't transferred in breast milk and we want women to breastfeed. Mm. So if she has respiratory symptoms, we want her to practice respiratory hygiene when she's caring for her baby. And that would be the same for any mother, irrespective mm. of their feeding type. So, um, but if she's breastfeeding and she's coughing, we know that um, the cough, the droplets from the cough would be spread to mm -hmm. the baby's respiratory system. So we want respiratory hygiene. And so they need a mask that would, um, is non penetrable to liquids for her to wear in that mm -hmm. when she's actually active with COVID symptoms. So it's about being, having common sense around changing a baby's nappy if you're coughing and you're COVID positive and you're isolating together at home um, or 
likelihood somebody else in the family has got it as well maybe maybe the partner so, so it's actually, everybody it's respiratory hygiene for covid positive suspected yeah. or covid positive parents so actually it's not to do with the type of feeding at all it's to do with the condition of the mother it's and to do she's, with if respiratory she's hygiene yeah. yeah yeah and it may be that the unit hasn't kind of caught up with that um guideline yeah and i think the again the difficulty at the moment is there's a lot of guidelines coming out you need to always and this is for our audience really check the date of the guideline you're using because mm -hmm. some guidelines are changing very quickly just mm -hmm. check and, and some, it might be some, that one's old yeah. and there's some excellent stuff from the who on, yeah. um, mm -hmm. and and it is like you say so it is some it is com it is difficult keeping up with it all mm -hmm. and always remember to put a common sense hat on it and think actually um if i was the mother what would what would be the best thing for me and, and the mm. baby and changing a nappy isn't any different is it and coughing over it to yeah. feeding it and coughing over it so i like this common sense hat this is nice <laughs> i like this <laughs> more of those please <laughs> And and someone it's someone has asked esther tidy has asked a very similar question which i think we've answered really um da, 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 da. There's a quite a long question. I don't know if we've got time for this one. Susan Viney again. Hi there. I've been a question for anyone. On Facebook, at the beginning of the lockdown, women were worried about the problem of finding formula milk, which I think Amy talked about earlier, which is now resolved. But at the time, a couple of mums were offering to pump off breast milk and deliver to the new mums. There were no treatments to the milk just given straight to the new mums. I suggested this wasn't the safest thing to do, as who knew what the mums were passing in their milk. However, a local doula and very well-known person shared a Facebook page where this is a common practice. What are your thoughts? I think that's quite a complicated one in the amount of time we've got <laughs> yeah. left. Um, maybe that's more of a discussion that we could have on the Facebook page, bringing in some links. Maybe. Up, I think it's it's quite tricky and could be misconstrued in any direction yeah i could I say though originally the, the global guidance that came out from china showed that um in their flow charts at the end of it was um the best thing for a baby is breast milk the second best thing is donor milk um and in some countries wet nursing may be the most appropriate thing to do in the uk we have a very good milk banking system it's not equitous across the country always but um, where it's available and there are lots of really good milk banks across the mm. country um, we know that pasteurization um, process is robust it's covered by nice guidance and it's best to go to your local um, donor milk bank and access donor milk or look okay. at heart's milk bank as well and then and we know that it's not just coronavirus that's transferred in breast milk so there's good screening processes okay. in the UK so this suggests this questioner or this questioner had was maybe reading something that was on international Facebook because our our um, bank milk is pasteurised and this obviously was either bypassing the system, which is unlikely here, I would have thought, they, they or can in be a different some, country. Yeah. yeah, in this country we have um, a, a system. good system guided by NICE and by the EU Human Milk Banking Association guidelines and the we don't need to do that here no. um so um you know donor breast milk is a really good uh, that's yeah. should be our best option um if we can't have the mother's own milk okay I've, uh, there's several questions actually that have been answered already like where the central point of getting information which we've dealt with oh. and uh, the last one i think because we are running short of time now is from me marika shaw saying deprived areas and video calls zoom chats not that compatible is there a way around this are these mothers are forgotten ones which we've kind of talked about a little bit i, I would don't say know if you wanted just, to add anything else the only they think quickly um, i don't know if any, amy wants to anything but there are the nhs is being um, funded by um their own governments in the nations to provide attend anywhere and lots of platforms that are secure that are linked to the hospital systems and um so you will find a variety but there are some very you know the the, the nhs is catching up on all this and providing some very good systems for the midwives to have secure 
um, virtual conversations with the women. With the women. And, and a telephone yeah. conversation can be very good too. It doesn't have to be face uh, a video. Yeah. And just to kind of add to that, I mean, that's the sort of thing that we want to be researching of what are the challenges and are there any innovative ways around it? Because how much, if, it, if we had the um, infrastructure there and it was just an issue of women and families not being able to afford high-speed internet, how much would it cost to provide them with high-speed internet to be able to do that? Um, it's not going to be much per family mm. um, and it could bring real savings in terms of that family's health, well-being, supporting them to breastfeed their baby if they want to. So that's the sort of thing that I'm thinking about when I'm thinking about what might the solutions be to try and reduce these inequalities if free internet helps, given free internet. There have been some lovely <laughs> stories, haven't there, in COVID about um, people who are COVID positive being provided with um, uh, video, uh, phones and video yeah. Um, yeah. resources. Absolutely. So. Well, I think I, th I think as as always, I could talk and listen to you guys forever, and it's been really interesting. We've had some fantastic questions, so thank you very much to everyone in the audience for asking the questions. We will be on Facebook for a while, so we'll try and answer some of the questions. But I think even if your specific question hasn't been answered, I think most of the topics have been taken care of. Um, I'd just like to thank Matflix and the, who've and support the video content from maternity experts for this um, hour and our partners, the Practicing Midwife Journal and all for maternity for their online resources, which also I've put on the resources list for later. I'd love to thank Francesca and Amy for a fantastic presentation and answering a lovely assortment of questions beautifully and, and giving us lots of food for thought. and highlighting the really important things that we need to think about as midwives and those supporting mums and their babies. So thank you very, very much. Um, there will be resources available on the website later. Next week, we're going to be looking at preeclampsia and preventing preeclampsia as it's World Preeclampsia Day on the 22nd of May. Um, and we've got Professor Andy Shen Shannon joining us next week. And in the meantime, I'd just like to say, stay safe and well. Look after yourselves and look after your loved ones and we'll see you next Wednesday at 7. Take care. Thank you. The Maternity and Midwifery Forum brings you Netflix. Video streaming from maternity experts. All your CPD and revalidation needs met in one place. Our expertly curated box sets are the perfect way to engage with the latest thinking, issue by issue. They make revalidation easy and are the perfect accompaniment to any project or university coursework. In addition to video from expert speakers across maternity and midwifery, there is easily accessible research and links to the latest government policy documents. Our reflective questions at the end are the perfect primer for your revalidation. In the same way the Maternity and Midwifery Forum provides certificates to show that you have attended these festivals, we can provide certificates for those who have consumed the content of a box set and submitted their written answers to the reflective questions provided by our curator, Dr Jenny Hall. Midwives, maternity professionals and students, do not miss out! Subscribe to Matflix today! Box sets are £17.50 each, or access to them all starts at £6.99 per month. Students pay just two ninety nine a month. Check out the box sets and subscribe today at www.matflix.co.uk. Thanks for watching this video from the Maternity and Midwifery Forum. For more expert opinion and analysis, hit the button below to subscribe.